Good morning and welcome back to the introduction to the workshop. In the next 45 minutes, I would like to discuss with you the basic motivation for these workshops, the objectives of the workshop and the activities that we have planned for the workshop. First of all, some reiteration of facts which probably are well known to most of our colleagues. We have more than 4000 engineering colleges, we have more than 2.5 million students studying engineering. We need more than a lakh of faculty members, perhaps more than lakh and 50,000. Unfortunately, our infrastructure for postgraduate programs for ME and PhD has not been able to keep pace with this growing requirement and therefore, a large number of our faculty colleagues are only first degree holders. The conventional solutions such as the QIP, IST programs which are run for two weeks, but for a limited number of teachers such as 25 to 30 people assembled at a particular place, whether it is in IIT, NIT or any other institution, does not address the issue of scale. We have more than 1 lakh teachers and these solutions will not scale up. On the other hand, the new solutions such as e-learning uh, methodologies and the contents, NPTEL for example, which is an extremely important initiative, while these are important, they do not address the adoption into our regular teaching. We actually analyzed the reason why such material is not being adopted and we found out that most of the course contents are being created independent of the teachers and students for whom these contents are intended. For example, many of our courses are actually designed to be taught in the IIT environment which because of the tremendous academic freedom can actually be significantly different from an environment in a university college where students are required to study towards their examination and the syllabus and teachers are required to address these issues. That is one of the reasons why some of these solutions are not getting adopted. We at IIT Bombay have been working with some initiatives in our e-outreach program particularly. We conduct workshops across multiple centers using VSATs. Distance education incidentally was launched in IIT Bombay almost 10 years ago in the year 2000. We then capture the audio video text assignments and everything of the course that is offered, the workshop or whatever and then we edit and release all of these contents in open source. The open source release, the advantages are first of all that huge scaling is possible because large number of participants can attend this. We had courses by the way offered earlier to students and working professionals where we had attendance of 500 and 700 participants across the country even from our limited number of remote sensors, centers about 14 or 15 by then. From a teacher's perspective and from the student's perspective, the learning material that so gets created is freely usable by us. So not only the examples that we give, the slides that we make, but even complete audio video lectures will be released in open source which are usable by everybody. Having said this, let me also reiterate some of the problems that are faced by us as teachers. There are many of course and all of you are familiar with those, but I will reiterate only two problems. One problem is that of the large class size. A large class size makes individual attention impossible. Consider this workshop and imagine that instead of you as my teacher colleagues participating in this workshop, there were 1000 students participating from different centers. In fact, there could also be even 10,000 students. Then it is very obvious that I as a teacher would not be able to pay attention to every individual. Secondly, a common pace gets suggested for all the lectures. Now, when I plot the ability of the individuals attending a course like this to grasp the material and the ability of these people to do hard work, 
I will get a spread of the points on this, uh, 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 on this graph where one axis represents the hard work ability and the other axis represents the grasping ability. I would like to emphasize that by grasp, I do not mean only the intellectual capability which is inherent in an individual because the grasp depends not only on the intellectual ability, it also depends upon the level of preparedness of the student. It also depends upon the motivation that the student has to understand something. So, grasp and hard work are some way linked through what I call sincerity of purpose and tremendous passion for learning. Now, you will agree that my students in any class, in a large class would be spread across this. When I decide on a common pace, let us say the common pace addresses a student somewhere here. If I plot that student, I find this average point let us say at this point. My observation on this graph is that at this exact average point, there may not be any single student. Although I have large number of students, these students may be spread all across it. Theoretically then, am I addressing in my class no student, which sounds ridiculous. The real implication is that when I set up a pace to address the average of the class, what happens is that everybody gets attracted to that pace, everybody works at that pace. Consequently, while people in this particular region of the graph might push themselves forward in working harder and grasping better, the other people in the class actually gets decelerated. More importantly, a person here will probably like to go somewhere here. In fact, ideally every person should go there. But this average pace forces people to sort of become complacent with less achievements than what is possible. The effective teaching learning should bring out the best in every student and ideally a student or a participant should be able to move on this graph. Now, the way we address this large class size, take this workshop for example, in this workshop I may be the only teacher, but effectively you have many teachers. At each remote center, you have not only a course coordinator, but the course coordinator is assisted by experienced colleague, both teaching and technical colleagues. What we do in IIT system for example, when I teach a course in programming, I had 850 students last year, this year I will have 950 students. I am the single teacher, yet I have 50 teaching assistants. We are fortunate because we have our MTech and PhD students who work as our teaching assistants. In smaller colleges, I would suggest that if you do not have strong PG programs, some senior students who have done this course and who are interested in teaching could be enthused to become teaching assistants for first year students. This could be in addition to your teacher colleagues and technical colleagues. But while in a lecture it is not possible to pay individual attention to participants, it should always be possible to pay individual attention during the laboratory and the tutorial session. I believe it is vital. So, this was one problem. The other equally important problem is the mindset of our students. Many of us find that our students do not appear to be interested in learning for the sake of gaining knowledge, but perhaps learning for the sake of clearing examinations. The objective of the students seem to be at loggerheads with the general objective of education. I illustrate this problem in a slightly different way, which may appeal to my teaching colleagues. Consider for a moment a slightly different problem, a problem of doing research and doing PhD. How is research and education related? Please bear with me, I will connect this up with the mindset of the students that we face and how to solve it. So, I will comment briefly on research and education. We believe that education is when people study their 10th, 12th standard, they do a first graduate degree, B.Tech, B.E. or something, they do a master's degree. In master's degree, we believe some amount of research may start, but when they work for PhD degree, that is when the research really occurs. In my humble opinion, PhD is not just a degree. So, when somebody says he is pursuing a PhD degree, he or she is only speaking half truth. What is PhD? 
not only in my opinion, but in the opinion of many, many of the research faculties across the world, PhD is about a mindset. What does that mindset represent? That mindset represents the broad perspective of a problem. That mindset represents spirit of inquiry, okay. tremendous curiosity to find out what has been attempted earlier, what are the different dimensions of this problem, who has succeeded in solving what portion of the problem, who has not succeeded in doing anything. Critical analysis of all these issues is implied in that mindset. Succinct articulation is a fundamental requirement of that mindset. I must be able to articulate, I must be able to state both in verbal communication with colleagues as well as in written communication. Sadly, Indians culturally are deficient in written communication because our knowledge exchange traditions have been verbal in the past. So, you will recall that this is one of the reasons why we are not able to write as many research papers or as many books as our counterparts in developed countries do, but that is a larger problem. In the context of the PhD mindset that I was describing, succinct articulation is an ability that the mind must develop both in written and verbal form. Discussions, again extraordinary important in developing that mindset is to have a clarity of the situation through a lot of discussions. This is another place where we must engage ourselves in discussing our ideas with other colleagues, seek their opinions, comment on their ideas. It is these discussions which help us in sharpening our own understanding of the problem and possible solutions. Meticulous hard work that is also required to become an intrinsic attribute of the mindset for PhD. Because without hard work, you will not be able to comprehensively do either a critical analysis or what is required is synthesis, rigor and discipline. I will just give you one example on the mathematical rigor which I saw in one book. Ordinarily, if you have three values say A, B and C and if you want to say that these three values are distinct, we often say A not equal to B not equal to C. Only in one book I found out a writing which said A not equal to B not equal to C not equal to A. Please remember that the first version does not necessarily imply that C is not equal to A. To my mind this is rigor. Do we apply the same amount of rigor and discipline in everything that we articulate or think? That is a requirement which becomes very essential in describing a PhD mindset. Perseverance, ability not to give up. You know, you do not get a solution to a difficult problem, you keep searching for that solution, you keep trying again and again and again, that is required. Synthesis, it is not adequate to critically analyze everything and understand that this particular thing works in this particular fashion, that particular thing does not work there and so on, but ultimately since I am going to solve a problem, I should be able to synthesize a solution from whatever components I have discovered from whatever components I have invented and put them together to frame a solution. Eventually, the mindset must reach its absolute pinnacle in its ability to solve problems. Please understand that particularly in the technical domain when we talk of engineering and science education, we are essentially training our researchers for solving problems and this problem solving mindset is extremely important to achieve. Innovation, I must think out of the box, I must discard some of the known routes to a problem solution if they have not worked well, I must think of completely independent solution or independent approach, this innovative thinking has to be part of my mindset. This is how human knowledge gets extended, this is how one's own knowledge gets extended. Having described PhD as a mindset, I will not, I will now ask all my colleagues a simple question. Is this not the objective of education at all levels? Now I am trying to relate 
the notion of what people understand from a PhD or a research to what people understand from education. I am submitting humbly that all that I have described about the mindset to be achieved while doing PhD, I humbly submit that I require that mindset to be achieved at all levels of education. Consider for example, when a young boy or girl passes fifth standard, do we not expect the fifth standard pass student to be able to succinctly articulate the thoughts, to be able to correctly understand what other people are articulating both in the written and verbal sense. When a student passes 10th standard or 12th standard with mathematics, do we not expect that student to have achieved a mindset by which the student is able to critically analyze the scientific context, uh, concepts and understand the entire logic behind the scientific and mathematical thinking and should be able to apply that logic. When a student is doing first course in engineering or science at the graduate level, let us say a BSc, MSc or BE or BTEC, do we not expect that student to understand very critically all concepts, understand what are the solutions that people have proposed and actually be able to solve problems? In fact, do we not expect our students at all levels to be great problem solvers to the limited extent that their education permits them to? I submit then that the development of this mindset is an objective of education not only at all levels of education but also subsequently in our professional career. So those of us who have completed our so called PhD degree actually have achieved that mindset. Why do we call that as a separate item of research achievement or something? Actually in my opinion PhD is merely a recognition by the academic fraternity of the community to say that you have achieved the required mindset to the best possible extent and now onwards further extending it is entirely up to you. You need not seek any help from others, rather we expect you to help others in achieving that mindset. I therefore regard education and research as a large continuum. I do not therefore distinguish between research and education. I would submit humbly to all my teacher colleagues that even when I am teaching a first year BE student a course in programming, I must actually expect that student to achieve at least part of this mindset in all dimensions. Similarly, even though I am a teacher and I might have done a whole lot of research in my life, I must continuously endeavor to further sharpen this mindset in all its dimensions. It is therefore important for us to understand that in this workshop, we would try to further our own abilities in each of these aspects that I have stated with some amount of delta which may vary with each individual, but we would like to move towards a higher mindset of the kind of qualities that I have described and it will be our endeavor when we go back and teach our students to try and ensure that each and every student whom we teach is helped by us so that he or she can achieve this mindset to a greater extent when the student passes our course. What comes in the way? I already described the large classroom size as one of the problem, but there are other problems from the student side and that problem is the attitude of our students. This attitude is unfortunately set up by the rat race for marks. This rat race for marks dictates what the students will give priority to. Many of my teacher colleagues from across the country have confessed to me that they find their students are less interested in attending classes or doing some experiment which is not specifically uh, dictated by the syllabus, but they are interested in attending coaching classes which trains them to answer examination questions very correctly and getting marks. This rat rate of marks is actually eating into the quality of our educational system. Sadly, this cannot be corrected unless we revamp our entire examination system. Let me comment briefly on why the IIT systems are able to produce a slightly better quality of education. Of course, many people say that you get the best students 
uh, from the country, etc. That might be only partially true because I personally believe that all students who join engineering are reasonably good to begin with and they should be able to solve any logical problems if they apply themselves and if they are taught well. The great difference is that when I teach at IIT Bombay, I define my syllabus. Of course, there is some boundary syllabus that has been defined earlier and approved by our undergraduate program committee and such, but I am permitted to modify the syllabus as I teach. More important, when I teach a course, I set the question paper. I examine the answer books and I allocate the grades. This immediately tells the student that the objective, even if he or she wishes to get a good grade in the course, is to attend the lectures seriously, do all the assignments properly because the examination paper is going to be set by the same teacher. Secondly, the examination papers that we invariably set here does not have a set pattern. There have been instances where a teacher has given just one problem in the entire paper. There are instances where some teachers conduct one mid-semester examination, a couple of quizzes and an end sem, whereas another teacher conducts 20 quizzes. I had in my course in programming, for example, uh, I had something like 20 quiz questions and about 8 assignments and the lab assignments. We invariably have a course project. In this course project, consider our course on computer programming. In a course project, we allocate an activity to be solved by a team of students. These could be 4 or 5 people team or 3 people team. In fact, last year when I taught this programming course after a gap of over 25 years, I actually made teams of 20 students each because I had more than 800 students, so I had 40 such teams. And I allocated group projects, but I insisted that these 20 people should further subdivide this project. And there were individually five smaller groups in each of the teams. And each group was given a specific task. The advantage is that such groups are able to write a sizable size of program, a, a large program to solve a specific problem. Now, these are the small things which an IIT system, and I say IIT system, but any system which provides complete academic freedom to the teaching community can experiment with and can evolve a mechanism. Let me describe first what happens when we set this rat race for marks. This creates a few winners and many losers. You will find therefore that your students who score very good marks, they acquire overconfidence. And while of course they score well, they are not necessarily working to the best of their abilities. They could perhaps have done much more. They not only become complacent, but sometimes their overconfidence borders on arrogance. I have seen many such arrogant people because in IIT system when you crack joint entrance exam and let us say when you are in the top 100 ranks, you think that you are the best in the world without realizing that there are probably millions of human beings who are perhaps better than you, but you do not know them. So, this overconfidence bordering on arrogance is a great danger that could afflict those few winners. But more concern is about the losers because they are in large number. The losers develop diffidence and this diffidence often borders on despondence. I have seen students giving up in the first two or three months of their entry into engineering college assuming that they will not be able to cope up with this education because for whatever reason they believe that they are not able to understand things, they are not able to get good scores in quizzes and assignments and therefore they give up. That is the larger class or body of students that we as teachers must be far more concerned about. As I said earlier, we must ideally be concerned about each and every student. For us, remember, it may be a class of 60 or 100 students. But for each student doing that course, we represent the only teaching faculty available to him or her. How do we take care of this despondence? And how do we take care of these arrogance? The right solution is to allocate work which is different for different people. One solution which I had found, for example, in, 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 in teaching the undergraduate course in programming is that I discovered, I broadly found out three different groups in the class. One group 
which had done programming extensively in their 11th and 12th standard. There were about 80 or 90 students. For them, what was being taught was child's play. These people were engaged by me in some extra classes where they were given harder and challenging problems. That had nothing to do with examination. My exams were scheduled to address the average of the class as I mentioned, but they were given separate challenging problems. I had also identified about 100 people who were relatively weak in their ability to answer questions on programming concepts. Every Saturday or Sunday, I would conduct extra lectures for them, doing a little bit of spoon feeding, but explaining the concepts with some simpler examples. I had a very peculiar problem in IIT, which I am sure you would be facing in your colleges as well. This happens in the first year course. By the time students reach third year and fourth year, the issue has been addressed. And the issue is that of the language, which is used as a medium of instruction. As you all know, our engineering education uses English language as the medium of instruction. So, we give our lectures in English, our books are in English, our manuals are in English. However, a very large number of capable students joining the first year of our engineering program often come after study in their native language. This has happened to many of us. I myself did my higher secondary examination from Gwalior using Hindi as a medium. And I had absolutely great problems in the first few months of my engineering curriculum, where every teacher was speaking in English, the books were in English. In fact, I was learning English through physics, English through chemistry. That time there was no computer program. This is a real problem. I attempted to solve it last year by actually giving some Hindi lectures. Unfortunately, Hindi is not the only language in which our young students study and come to engineering. I have found out, for example, that in many colleges, teachers say that while the teaching may be in English, but often students ask questions in Telugu or Tamil or Gujarati or Marathi, depending upon whatever is the locale, and they understand answers given in the same languages better. To my mind, there is nothing wrong with it. Our students are smart enough. Given enough time, they will understand English language adequately. But when they come in the first year, they do not have that time. Since we are talking about a course on computer programming, and since that course is taught in the very first year and first semester to about 6 lakh students across the country, I humbly submit that we need to address this problem compassionately. It is no good saying, no, they must learn English. If they do not learn English, that is their problem. It is not their problem. As teachers, it is our problem as well. My endeavor would now be, as I will explain later towards this workshop, through this workshop and through the collaborative mechanism that we will set up, we would try to get good, useful educational resources, at least in the first year courses, available in multiple languages. I recommend that in our students, we try to develop what I call the child's attitude, which I have found to be extremely important in achieving success in life. These three aspects of a child's attitude are curiosity, boldness and perseverance. All of us who have seen children, young children, three year, four year, four year, five year, six year old children, you will find that they are extremely curious about things, they are very bold in asking any kind of question that comes to their mind, and they never give up once they decide to do something. That is the reason why children achieve a unique distinction, which all of us in our grown up years find it extremely difficult to achieve. And what is that problem that I have in mind? The problem of learning a foreign language. Those of us who have attempted to learn German or French or Arabic or any other foreign language would testify that it is an extremely difficult thing when you do it in your later years. You give an elementary examination in German, you give an advanced course in German, you then spend some time maybe with Max Müller Bauer, and still you are not able to speak German as fluently and understand very rapidly spoken German. You may be able to read and understand book probably with the help of dictionary. But please note, in six years, he is able to learn a foreign language which is later on called the mother tongue of that child. And the child learns it without ever attending a single course, without getting any certificate, without passing any examination. The child is learning entirely on its own. And the child is learning because precisely of these three qualities, 
curiosity, boldness to ask questions and perseverance. Keep on trying, keep on trying, keep on trying. If we can somehow enthuse our young students to recall their childhood days, what they achieved, the distinction of learning a foreign language and then say learning English may take time, but it is easy. Learning computer programming of course is easy because that is a stupid subset of a natural language. Of course, that is easier said than done, but this is the way I have found our students can be excited. Finally, for ourselves, I will say that whatever I just mentioned applies to all of us. In some sense, we are like children. In some sense, we are like students. We are students of the profession of teaching. We are students of the profession of problem solving. In our own professional career, whatever I said must be adopted by us. There is no end. And there is no ultimate limit to which our mindset can be sharpened. We therefore must develop excitement and passion in whatever we do. Since we do teaching as our major job, we must develop excitement and passion in our teaching. We must also develop humility and we must also develop ethics. This is not the time to venture into greater discussions on these issues, but I personally regard these as extremely important because these define our character. And our character, whether we like it or not, whether we notice it or not, is always uppermost in the minds of our students. Our students are observing us, every action that we take, everything that we do. And the students do treat us as their role models. They would like to treat us as their role models. And therefore, whatever we do has a great impact and effect on our students. Therefore, it is our responsibility to rise higher in terms of the expectations. Finally, our endeavor must be to empower learners to climb the peak of success. Since we ourselves are learners, we must endeavor to climb the peak of success in our own fields of aim. With this backdrop, I would like to describe the structure of the proposed workshops. I will take you back to the earlier discussion that I had, where I mentioned that the scalability problem exists in terms of the educational process that we have, where more than uh, almost 2.5 million students studying engineering across the country in more than 4,000 colleges, about 100,000 teachers to be trained in various subjects. Take for example, just the computer programming course. In 4,000 colleges, if it is taught, there are at least 4,000 teachers teaching it directly. Are there only 4,000? No, that is not true. Because in every college, all students joining first year in any stream practically will have to undergo a programming course. It will not be uncommon to have three or four teachers and about four or five technical support staff helping to conduct the labs and their tutorial sessions. We are therefore talking of at least five to six people from every college being involved in the teaching learning of computer program. Even if you take five people and 4,000 colleges, we are talking about 20,000 teachers. And all of them face this problem that they have not been fortunate enough to either been able to do a master's program or a PhD program, they probably have their first degree. They themselves have come out of colleges where the environment perhaps was less conducive to do a lot of rigorous programming and therefore, their own level of experience in programming is limited. How do we address these people? So, what we thought is if we conduct a IST kind of workshop, not for 20 or 30 people, but for 1000 teachers. And we engage 1000 teachers per subject, both prior to the course as also post course. Now, this is something which is not common in an IST workshop model. In an IST workshop model, many of you would have attended several IST workshops. I have conducted some. Typically, what happens is that in a particular subject, a 15 days engagement is done. Of course, there is a lot of give and take of knowledge there. But at the end of 15 days, uh, certificates are distributed teachers go back to their respective places and they do not necessarily remain engaged with either that subject or with the group which attended with them in their later years. Our model is slightly different. It is not merely scaling the number of attendees in an IST workshop that we are talking about, but we are talking about encouraging faculty to interact. We are talking about blending synchronous and asynchronous mechanisms. A synchronous mechanism is a live lecture like I am giving today. It is semi-synchronous because 
interaction from your side will be limited, but we shall do adequate amount of it during this course. This mechanism of releasing all contents in open source will permit faculty to adapt the course material later. Why? Because not only they can use the slides, audio, video lectures, questions that are created, question banks, project themes, but they can also change any one of these, which is so different from a printed book or which is so different from any proprietary thing. Because it is open source, as long as you acknowledge that the source of this was so and so or the material was created by so and so people, you can freely use it, you can freely change it, you can freely modify it. At a later stage, I will describe the Creative Commons license for open source that we use. What we specifically plan in this workshop is, we shall have lectures in the morning and lab sessions in the afternoon. Uh, I have the uh, detailed schedule for the workshop which I had dispatched to all the course coordinators. We have also kept it on the Moodle page. In the afternoon, in the first lab session, when you become familiar with the Linux environment that our uh, colleague coordinators would have set up for you in the respective labs, you will also look at the Moodle. Some of you would have done that. I urge all the remaining participating teachers to necessarily activate their Moodle account. That is our only way of formal asynchronous interaction between you and us and in fact between all of us. So please do activate your Moodle account and in that Moodle you will find that the detailed schedule has been pasted. Very briefly, there are lectures in the morning, there will be two sessions 9.30 to 11 and 11.30 to 1 with an half an hour tea break. Half an hour tea break is actually more than what is necessary. Generally a 15 minute tea break will suffice, but this will permit participating teachers at remote centers to interact with each other. I would submit that to utilize this time as also the laboratory time to keep discussing issues that come in way of a proper teaching of computer programming in your respective colleges. Later on I will uh, suggest ways in which you can actually consolidate some of your discussion, filter them out and submit them for larger audience so that most of our participants including us here would benefit from it. In this workshop, it is required that teams be formed for undertaking group activities. Some of the group activities will be part of the labs here, but some of the group activities will extend beyond the completion of the workshop. And this is something that I would like to submit is so different from the conventional IST workshop. Ordinarily, certificates are issued to the participating teachers at the end of the workshop period. However, we do two things here. One, we allocate a certain assignment to all participating teachers, which is actually a group assignment, which is to be done by the teams which are formed when you are here. This group assignment has to be submitted within two weeks of the completion of the workshop. So, since our workshop ends on 10th of July, I would expect somewhere around 25th of July to be the deadline by which all the participating groups must submit this workshop assignment. The IST certificates will be issued by the coordinators of the respective centers only at the end of this submission. Secondly, there would be programming projects which we would like teams to undertake. These are the kind of programming projects which can be eventually given to our participating students when we teach the course in order to enhance their programming experience. This activity, however, is optional because a programming project is not done in 10 days or 15 days of time, particularly when the group participating in that project activity is not physically at one place. There may be in a group of few teachers from the same college, there may be few others who are at remote place and interaction between them for this programming project will have to be undertaken through emails and all. We typically give a time period of about three months to complete these projects. It is an entirely optional activity. Let me describe to you what was achieved in the pilot workshop that we conducted in December, where we had about 650 teachers. Incidentally, 650 teachers assembling for a single IST course or a single subject was the first time in this country and Dr. Shetty and Mr. Haryanan from IST remarked that 
at this scale probably this kind of assembly of teachers for knowledge interaction at this scale has never happened anywhere in the world. I was very happy to note that. You will also be very happy to note that this time which is the first formal workshop that we are conducting in the national mission after successfully completing the pilot. The participating teachers are I do not know what is the latest number 1054 people have enrolled, but we will know by the evening today. Well, 1054 people have confirmed, uh, but we will get the actual attendance because it may so happen that a few of the participating teachers may develop problems at the last minute and may not, may not show up. But I must thank all of you profusely for really participating in this endeavor. But please remember that to make this endeavor successful, it is not adequate that I prepare well and give you good lectures and good material to think about. But it is also important that each one of you individually as well as in the groups that you will form at the remote centers jointly with the senior colleagues at the remote center must endeavor to contribute significantly to this effort. Please understand that our objective is to do sustained collaboration. Sustained collaboration is the key word. Our interaction and engagement may have begun with this workshop, but it will not end with this workshop. I was describing to you the achievements in the uh, last pilot, the contributions to the question bank which was part of the workshop assignment based on which the certificates of uh, achievement was given, the IST certificates were given. We have received more than 1800 questions as contribution from these 650 teachers along with their answers. All of these are being edited. Unfortunately, what we found out that in many questions, the language used to frame the question was not very clear. So, we had to edit a whole lot of not just English language, but the wording of the question. In some cases, unfortunately, we found that the programs given as solutions were not working correctly. So, a lot of editing had to be done. This time, we will put an appropriate filtering and editing process in place, so that such things do not happen. But please understand the power of the collaboration. 650 teachers together could contribute more than 1800 questions. We have sanitized about 600 of these questions. Uh, we put some 20 MTech TS to do that job in the last semester and we will work out a mechanism to ensure what to do with them. The optional projects that we had, uh, the programming projects, more than 140 teachers actually submitted these projects. We are still awaiting the evaluation of these projects by the remote centers because we have promised that the best project attempts will be given a cash reward as a recognition, as an humble acknowledgement of their contribution. But more importantly, when I say sustained collaboration, what do I expect? Hopefully from all thousand teachers who are participating, but certainly from those teachers who are more enthusiastic, who are a little more passionate and who more importantly are willing to give a little more time for this endeavor. What we are going to do is we are going to launch a portal, an educational portal on computer programming. In fact, as a part of the national mission, we are going to undertake such workshops for 10 important courses in engineering. Many of them will be general engineering courses such as basic mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, electronics engineering. There would be a few electives in each of these areas. Our workshops in December which are planned, one is on object oriented programming and the other is on database technology. These are two important uh, uh, subjects which are taught to a very large number of CS and IT students who form about 50 percent or more than 50 percent of the total student community. Coming back to this, after every workshop we shall be releasing not only the course contents, not only the lectures, not only the videos, not only the text, but everything we shall be releasing in open source including the question bank. When you contribute to the questions, when you contribute to the programming projects, these will be released in open source for everybody to use and see and these will carry your names, the names of the contributors. Believe me, all over the world, the large open source communities essentially work because they find great value in both contributing and using the contents in open source. So, sustained collaboration therefore, is the keyword that I would like all of you to remember. Ideally, I would like all thousand people to remain engaged 
it is not possible to remain engaged with all thousand people, but at least remain engaged with your groups, remain engaged with the other colleagues that you meet and remain engaged with the other colleagues who have never met physically, but who have been participants here and have collaborated with you in some kind of the effort. The portal incidentally which you are launching, which will permit all of you to automatically be registered for the portal as the first users, both the pilot workshop uh, participants as well as this workshop participants and we, I expect personally and the, in fact the Indian educational community expects that those of you who are more passionate about joining this effort will remain engaged over a longer period helping us to form editorial board to manage this portal. In the course of this workshop, I will describe something more about this portal, but right now I welcome you to this exciting collaborative effort and I thank you for your patient hearing.